Rolling hills, lush grass prairies, a cottonwood or two every few miles, and these are down in the draws where a creek might run when it rains. The view from horizon to horizon is unbroken. This is a panorama that hasn't changed in centuries. This is the Great Plains, and these are the Flint Hills, the place where the Creator spent a little extra time to design cow country, to make a heaven on earth for the bovine species. This is also a battleground. It is littered with the ghosts of brave warriors, both man and animal, that have fallen here over the centuries, and it stands ready for more. The sounds of battle this time are somewhat muted compared to the other wars that have been fought here. However, the reason for the conflict is the same as when Indian tribe fought Indian tribe and when Indian tribes fought white men for control of the land. One thing has changed over time, the types of weapons used. Once it was bows and arrows and spears, then rifles and cannons. Today, the weaponry is no less lethal, the law, the courts, and the legislative process. There is, however, one certainty that will result from the current battle over who will own this land and how it will be used. In the end, the defeated will be doomed to extinction. The conquerors will become the defenders, and the cycle will repeat itself. If only we would listen, the past would teach us about tomorrow, about the outcome of the current war over land use and land ownership. And what would history tell us about the future of prairies like this and that of the forests in the Northwest and the mountain and desert country of the West? There are no better subjects in history to learn from than the Native American and his sacred buffalo. As near as anyone can tell, this is where the ruminant animal has thrived for more than 100,000 years. During most of that time, the buffalo was king and reigned over a million square mile kingdom of prairie. The camel and saber-toothed tiger originated out here and ran around with the buffalo for a while until they decided to cross a momentary land bridge to find homes elsewhere on other continents. But the buffalo liked it here and it stayed as long as it could. So did the Plains Indian. This was his land, too. By agreement, each tribe had its own designated hunting grounds. The buffalo that roamed within a particular hunting ground belonged to the tribe that held verbal title to the area. The Plains Indian existence was totally and completely dependent upon the buffalo. It was not only the primary source of food, it also provided clothing, shelter, medicines, tools, weapons, fuel, and much, much more. The buffalo roamed at will over these prairies and great herds. One early day traveler through here noted that his journey was delayed at one point for five days while one great continuous herd moved across his trail. He estimated that there were more than four million head of buffalo in the herd. Their awkward and cumbersome physical appearance belied their actual strength, speed, agility, and endurance. They were a match for any horse, able to run at speeds of 35 to 40 miles an hour from a standstill. And no single horse could ever match their endurance. A National Museum curator noted in 1902 that he needed a relay of several horses over a distance of 25 miles before capturing a single buffalo cow. Of course, there have been numerous notations in history recording living through the experience of the legendary buffalo stampede. The sound of their hooves created a continuous roar well before their arrival and well after their departure. And the ground shook as a thousand buffalo ran in panic flight from some unseen foe, destroying anything and everything in their path. At their peak, it is estimated that there were over 35 million head of buffalo. Between natural events and Indian hunting, the buffalo population was kept in check and in balance with the environment. 
Similarly, between natural events and the movement of buffalo herds, the prairies were cultivated. And when an imbalance between land and buffalo occurred, the human population was kept in check. All in all, it was a fairly efficient system that allowed the Native American, the buffalo, and the prairie to thrive and prosper. An ecosystem with all the parts in total harmony is probably the modern day phrase to describe the phenomena where the buffalo thrived on the land, the Indian thrived on the buffalo, and the land thrived from the activity of both. Hundreds of years would pass before the white man would truly appreciate and try to emulate these consummate managers of the prairie. During all of this harmonious activity, an evolutionary event was taking place on the eastern extremities of the continent. America was being discovered again. It had been discovered several times before. For example, Coronado coming up through Mexico had roamed these prairies searching for the golden city of Quivira. However, in 1607, America was discovered in a fairly permanent way with the settlement of Jamestown. It took a couple of hundred years for civilization to evolve to the point where people on the eastern seaboard began to feel crowded. In fact, it was almost exactly 200 years later, 1806, that Lieutenant Zebulon Pike was sent out with an army detachment to explore the prairie country. Pike's expedition came two years after Lewis and Clark passed through here on their way west. Pike wrote in his journal that the high prairies afforded excellent pasturage for millions of bison, but he did not believe these prairies were of any value for human habitation. He suggested that the plain's chief asset would be to provide a barrier against settlement of the mountain regions, which did not appear to be of any value either. In time, the plains would be considered an obstacle, an inconvenience to be endured in traveling to Santa Fe in the southwest or the Oregon country in the northwest. The country itself would prove to be a minor inconvenience in comparison to dealing with the Indians and enormous herds of buffalo. Even Horace Greeley's first reaction to the great American desert was disparaging. But then later he wrote, go west, young man, go west. And they did for the next hundred years or so. Easterners went west by the tens of thousands. The highways they followed were first cut in part by the Buffalo, the Santa Fe Trail, the Oregon Trail, and the Colorado Trail. By 1825, the trading business over the Santa Fe Trail had become so large and profitable that the government sent out a commission to negotiate a treaty with the Osage Indians to allow a safe passage of travelers on the trail. The cost to the federal government for the concession was $800 in cash and merchandise. The cost to the Plains Indian and his buffalo in time would prove to be exorbitant. The Santa Fe Trail Agreement was the first of two treaties that would make a reservation out of Kansas. Its eastern boundary was the Missouri River and extended west indefinitely. The Indians insisted that the treaties guarantee that they would hold their new land as long as the grass should grow and the water should run. The grass grew and the water ran, but in 1854, the Kansas Territory was formed and the government began to extinguish Indian titles to Kansas lands and began moving the tribe south to a newly formed Indian Territory, Oklahoma. The individual's only recourse to stay on his native land was to declare citizenship and be granted an allotment as any other homesteader, as allowed under the Kansas-Nebraska Bill. The Indian had been a nomad for centuries, and homesteading was not a desirable way of life, so they moved over time to the new land farther south. The majority did not move voluntarily, and their insistence on protecting their sacred buffalo made westward expansion difficult. But migration did continue at a rapid rate. It is estimated that more than 350,000 immigrants crossed the Missouri River on the ferries at St. Joseph alone during the westward expansion. There were literally hundreds of other river crossings with equal activity from 1860 to 1880. The buffalo served as the primary food source for all on their months-long travel west. The railroad crews and cavalries lived off these animals. Of course, all the while, there was a tremendous trade in buffalo hides and buffalo robes. The demand in the east seemed insatiable. This intrigue also made buffalo hunting a tremendous sport. They were slaughtered by the tens of thousands by sportsmen shooting from the windows of rail cars which passed through the herds on the prairies and months long hunting expeditions by the rich and famous. The Indians fought to protect their way of life, but they had a formidable foe. 
Generals Philip Sheridan and William Tecumseh Sherman of Civil War fame and in charge of the Indian Fighting Army determined that the only way to keep the Indian at home on the reservation was to destroy the buffalo. Army Colonel Richard Irving Dodge, commander at North Platte in 1867 said, kill every buffalo you can. Every buffalo gone is an Indian gone. An observer of the time, Frank Mayer, noted, the government was privy to the slaughter of the buffalo. A man could get all the government ammunition he wanted for nothing, provided he could show he was going to use it on buffalo. By the early to mid 1880s, the buffalo were indeed gone. A few small herds roamed for a few years afterwards, but the once thriving buffalo and the industry he created was dead. The Indian was starved into submission and the Western immigration continued unimpeded. The settlement of the West became fact as the white man traveled freely across the plains. A few travelers found these hills to their liking and stayed as squatters, homesteaders, sodbusters, and ranchers. The legendary trail drives came through these prairies from the south on the Chisholm, Goodnight, and Loving trails. This happened at about the same time that the railroads replaced wagon travel over the Santa Fe, Oregon, and Colorado trails. The extinction of the buffalo and its industry allowed the evolution of what was to replace it, the cattle industry. The transition was remarkably easy, almost natural, because what made these prairies the preferred home of the buffalo also made it a paradise for beef cattle. One area of Kansas in particular, the Blue Stem Hills, or Flint Hills, exemplifies the story. They comprise about four million acres which stretch in a belt across the state, varying in width from 30 to 60 miles. Early settlers thought the hills to be a wasteland and staked claims in the valleys. Being from the east, they were not comfortable unless surrounded by timber and forests. The view offered them from the plains was only indigenous prairie grass, buffalo grass. Their opinion of its potential was rather poor. The cattlemen, on the other hand, evaluated the situation differently. The reputation of the area today is that it is the most extensive and efficient cattle producing area in the country. The early visitors could not know that this short grass country was destined to play a major role in feeding not only a rapidly growing population in this country, but also the world through two world wars. This efficiency is caused by the limestone content of the soil. The topsoil is thin and the roots of the blue stem grass readily tap the lime and absorb it. There are at least five ledges of limestone between the levels of the valleys and the tops of the plateaus. Ranchers who know the area say weathered lime rock is spread over all the slopes below each outcrop by every shower of rain. The supply of lime at the grassroots is being constantly renewed and maintained at the maximum. The lime and flintstone is so shallow beneath the topsoil that it is totally unsuitable for cultivation. This buffalo grass is appropriately named in that it was not only the staple that allowed the buffalo to reign here for centuries unchallenged, but it's as durable as its namesake. During drought, it lies dormant and is almost instantly revitalized by traces of moisture. Moderate rainfall will allow the blue stem grass to grow belly deep to a horse. Rolla Clymer wrote this about the Flint Hills. By their own majesty, the hills reveal the puny stature of man and the futility of his own exertions. But even more eloquent was this bit of prosaic writing of John Ingalls when inspired by these prairies. Grass is the forgiveness of nature, her constant benediction. Fields trampled from battle, saturated with blood, torn with the ruts of cannons, grow green again with grass, and carnage is forgotten. It bears no blazonry of blooms to charm the senses with its fragrance or splendor but its homely hue is more enchanting than the lily or the rose. It yields no fruit in earth or air, and yet should its harvest fail for a single year, famine would depopulate the world. Today, the Great Plains is the most prolific food producing area in the world. Almost two-thirds of this country's 100 million head of beef cattle live and thrive here. Portions of it are suitable for cultivation and produce the abundance of wheat, corn, and soybeans that has allowed Americans a standard of living second to none other in the world. To the farmers and ranchers who own this land, it is sacred. It is the source of their livelihood, 
their total existence. That which grows upon it is also sacred and is cared for with an intensity that cannot be understood by those who do not live upon nor care for the land. Simply phrased, it is called husbandry, those who care. This lack of understanding is the cause of the war that is being waged here today, the ownership of the plains and the uses to which it will be put. This is not the only battleground. Other areas under siege include virtually all the western states. The conquerors of previous wars, the homesteaders and ranchers, are now the defenders. They are fighting nobly to fend off those who would see all farm and ranch land become national parks and preserves. Preservationists yearn to recreate the past so that they and future generations can visit occasionally and try to imagine how things were in days gone by. Their objectives are simple. Make private lands public and public lands inaccessible. Their methods are obtuse. Petition to have the lands in question declared natural habitats for endangered species. Or if they fail pursuing this venue, then environmental questions and concerns are raised. The fact is, the more people there are, the less environment there is. The more people there are, the less land there is for them to live on, less clean air to breathe, less water to drink, less food to eat, less everything. Yes, less everything, including available land to produce food on. It is unconscionable possibly even criminal, to espouse the philosophy that undeveloped land should be taken out of food production. These concepts are being put forward to a citizenry which is just beginning to understand the simple premise that every person has a responsibility for the welfare of this planet. The overwhelming majority of the country's population, some 98.5% of it, is incapable of basic survival. Basic survival is defined as being able to provide food, shelter, and clothing for oneself and one's family. Yet being the majority, their will is imminent. They are the public, those folks in whose name things are done, as in when done in the public interest. The public doesn't have a lot of experience and background in knowing how best to manage a few hundred million acres of farm and ranch land. The public has, however, expressed a very high level of competency in consuming the basics needed for survival without ever having to turn a hand to produce them. On the other hand, the public is very effective in voicing its opinions on any given matter. For example, in the early 1800s, when the Eastern citizenry began to feel crowded, it began to pursue its manifest destiny in the West. As we have noted, in between the Eastern populace and their objective in the West, lie an entire other society. However, in the public interest, this other society was literally legislated and then blown and starved into oblivion. The objective was simple, remove the Indian obstruction to Western migration. The methods were simple, make the Indian subservient to the white man's good by destroying his source of survival and simultaneously extinguishing all his legal title to the lands in question. Yes, if we would only listen, the past would teach us about tomorrow. We would learn that those who own the land care for it best. We would learn that there is an extraordinarily high price to pay for forcing change to the natural order. We would also learn that extinction is evolutionary, that in order for the new to evolve, the old must cease to exist. There's simply not enough room for both. This makes the long-term prospects for a successful preservationist philosophy highly unlikely. However, the short-term prospects are terrifying, for each attempt puts every American one day closer to starvation. It not only can happen, it has happened as a result of public policy. Unfortunately, public policy is an inanimate object. It is at best a momentary whim of the majority of the populace, which has a history of reversing itself all too quickly. Public policy is not a responsible being. It cannot care for the land. It cannot even care for the public. The management of the land is a generations-long proposition. We must understand that today's farmers and ranchers are the Indians of yesterday. There's no one better suited to care for the land. If public policy drives the farmer from the land this time, there will be no turning back. As we know, the plains were once covered with buffalo. 
Public policy drove the buffalo from the face of the earth, and the Indian followed them. If public policy drives the farmers and ranchers from the face of the earth, humanity will have no choice but to follow them. These, my friends, are the lessons of the buffalo.